Oh, hello everyone. Uh, this is going to be the first in our series of recorded lectures. Um, I hope you are all safe and healthy and at home, hopefully in your PJs, relaxing on your couch, listening to this lecture. Uh, this week we're going to cover class and inequality in human culture. Um, we're going to look at how uh, class systems develop and how poverty, in essence, is perpetuated using uh, different cultural systems. From a biological and evolutionary perspective, we may be asking, well, how does inequality itself form? Well, what we're really going back to is something or the notion of carrying capacity, right? This is kind of that maximum population of life that an environment can sustain, right? Generally, a carrying capacity is what dictates the type of subsistence practices uh, which are appropriate for a given environment. Um, really what we're talking about here is resources, right? Inequality develops over the kind of um, quest to obtain resources and to uh, use resources to benefit your culture or your own uh, individual um, wealth. So the primary questions that we'll be dealing with this week is, is inequality in class structure intrinsic to humans, right? Is it something that we are innately born with, right? Is it some sort of evolutionary holdover from our kind of uh, more ancient past when we may have had uh, more kind of physical dominance hierarchies within human groups? Uh, is inequality seen in all levels of culture from the most simple to complex, right? Do we have inequality in tribal level societies? Um, do we have inequality in all modern, uh, more complex uh, state level societies? Or does inequality evolve or increase as culture grows and evolves, right? Does inequality increase as complexity increase? Is inequality a function of uh, complexity? One of the examples that your book uses, or at least the uh, older edition of the book uses, is the Orioles uh, baseball team and wealth inequality, right? So we have this owner, his name is Peter Angelos, right? And he's the owner of the Orioles baseball team. Uh, Angelos himself was a... Um, <clears throat> Uh, union lawyer, and he actually fought for union rights and fought for uh, wage increases and fought for living wages for um, the unions that he represented. So um, you can kind of think of how this baseball franchise itself, headed by Angelos, um, represents kind of a wide spectrum of wealth inequality, with Angelos, of course, being at the top as the owner with uh, annual income of around $1.5 million a year, and the grounds workers being at the very bottom with an average pay of $11. So the point to the kind of Orioles uh, baseball story with uh, Peter Angelos is that, you know, it's kind of an ironic that someone who would fight as a lawyer for the unions would turn around and pay his workers um, so poorly, right? Someone who spent his career fighting and recognizing what a living wage is uh, would turn around and pay so, uh, so low to his own workers, right? So the lesson kind of here is perhaps wealth can make you blind to inequality, right? So that's kind of a uh, big question that anthropologists ask when they look at uh, issues relating to inequality in different societies. So we'll be talking a lot about class and um, class systems, and it's kind of uh, important to define what a class is, right? So a class, in essence, is a system of power based on wealth income and status within a culture that creates an unequal distribution of a culture's resources or a society's uh, resources, right? So some form of classism exists within all cultures, right? Each class has a means by which to wrest power from the cultural environment, whether you're part of a working class or an elite class or you're part of a secret society, let's say you're uh, a tribal member of the Pueblo people in the Southwest, right? Those secret societies each have can be considered part of their own class, right? So you have different class systems that exist um, depending on the culture that you're looking at. So one example of classism that we see in the U.S. is kind of the uh, Flint, Michigan water crisis that happened um, uh, relatively recently in history. Uh, and what essentially happened there is because of the kind of 
mass inequality or or kind of the low income nature of the area affected by the water crisis, the kind of federal response to it was very slow. Um, we've also kind of seen that pattern in other low income areas that have been hit very heavily by natural disasters. It seems that response patterns are slower. And it's not saying that this is due to racism or that this is due particularly to uh, the government trying to demean uh, people of low income. This is simply because that those neighborhoods based on tax structures have less resources to immediately respond themselves. Those cities have less resources and the government um, has less uh, government agents in those areas that can respond to those things based on resource distribution. So I uh, urge you guys, there's going to be a YouTube link to a video about the uh, Flint, Michigan water crisis that I'd like you to watch. But uh, kind of to summarize the issue, um, in essence, the Flint city officials decided to change the water source, right? So Flint residents could no longer afford the Detroit water rate. So, so Flint, Michigan began getting water from the Flint River, which had been documented to be polluted, right? So because of this kind of difference in availability of resource and in terms of uh, ability to pay uh, on the city end for the kind of more expensive uh, Detroit water, um, they were forced to kind of switch and uh, use a water source and provide their citizens with a uh, less than quality um, source of drinking water. When cultural anthropologists look at inequality systems within cultures, they make a differentiation between wealth versus income, right? Wealth can be defined as the total accumulation of all an individual's assets, investments, cash, and property minus any debt. So it's basically everything you own, all your money, all your property, right? Minus anything that you owe uh, to any outside party. Uh, your income, on the other hand, is what an individual earns from work plus dividend from investment plus rents and royalties, right? That's your actual physical money that is coming into you, right? It does not include um, all of your actual property. So in more modern kind of class structures, at least ones that we see in larger state level societies, you have a general pattern of uh, mostly an 80% uh, working or lower class, then you have about an 18 to 20%, uh, usually around 18%, uh, coordinator class, right? That would be kind of your middle managers. And then you usually have a one to 2% elite class, right? This is just showing you a general pattern in terms of how populations are broken up in terms of inequality, right? On the right side of the little chart here, little uh, graphic, you see the source of power or the source of cultural power that each of those classes have, right? So the working class or the lower classes in any given culture, most of their power, most of their ability to negotiate culture comes from their ability to have solidarity with one another because they are the more populous of the entire group, right? The coordinator class, the ones that are designated to kind of uh, decide on divisions of labor for the working class or the lower classes, they garner their power from the ability to manipulate those divisions of labor, right? Uh, so that's how they use uh, to maintain their own level of power. The capitalist class, uh, at least on the chart, or more importantly, the elite class, uh, whether you're looking at a society that has royalty, a society that has wealthy elite, or a society that has religious elite, those elite classes uh, rest their power from the ownership of the means of production or ownership over some sort of specialized knowledge that the that is integral to the operation of the culture, integral to the operation of society as a whole. Or if you prefer, you can kind of look at it in terms of a corporate structure, right? The manager uh, kind of craps on the executives, the executive craps on the department heads, and well, then you have the rest, the workers. Um, or if you prefer in a academic sense, we have the uh, president of the university comes down on the deans, the deans come down on the department heads, and the department heads come down on us lowly professors here. 
So if we look at kind of the roots of poverty, uh, when we look at state level modern societies that have large complex government or bureaucratic systems, um, governments today use things like poverty lines to determine eligibility for um, social welfare or social aid. And poverty lines are often unrealistic reflections of wealth, right, and are not regularly updated to match inflation or the stagnation of wages, right? So poverty rates will vary based on a whole host of factors, not just simply income coming in. So we'll look at a couple um, different kind of social organizational structures that lead to different classes. Um, the kind of lower uh, base level organizational structure that we see in very, um, in kind of the least populous societies is something called um, egalitarianism, right? It's based on the notion of people sharing resources within a group equally. Um, it's usually seen in hunter-gatherer societies like our Yanomamo in uh, Brazil, right? Or perhaps um, some of our Polynesian groups in Southeast Asia. Uh, the responsibility for resource acquisition is shared among all members of the group. So each member of the group is equally important in terms of acquiring resources for the group to share as a whole. There can even be subsystems of egalitarian within a larger culture, which is not egalitarian, right? The uh, book or the example that your book uses is the communal property rights and living organizations seen within the Amish and the Hutterites um, as an example. But um, I, as a cultural anthropologist, would also make the argument that when you even look inside of these quote unquote egalitarian structures, there are always individuals that hold more decision making power, right? So I don't want you to think that inequality in terms of class structure really solely exists on wealth alone, right? Inequality can also exist in terms of uh, power, right? These power differentials in terms of who gets to make decisions, who gets to decide what's normal and what's abnormal. So moving up into kind of your next level of social organizational complexity, right? We have these rank-based societies. These are societies that value prestige and status rather than wealth. Wealth in these societies may or may not be stratified. In ranked societies, we generally see a redistribution of wealth by those with the highest prestige, right? So an example of this that we're gonna look at is the Kwakiato people of the Pacific Northwest in the United States and uh, Southwestern Canada. Um, we're gonna take a look because rank uh, in Kwakiato people is extraordinarily important, right? Rank is uh, how they operate their daily lives in terms of how they interact with one another and more importantly, how resources are distributed within the group as a whole. So if we look at an example of how a wealth system or how a uh, rank system works within the Kwakiato, we'll go back to kind of our example that we've used a few times, that Kwakiato wedding ceremony, right? It spans several months. Of course, it begins with economic negotiations, right? And that's mainly because in Kwakiato groups, um, you know, everybody's responsible for resource acquisition within the group, right? So by having these marriages happen, right, one of those groups, one of those kin groups is losing a potential worker, a potential person that can gather resources for that family group. So there has to be a little bit of economic negotiation when they go into um, deciding who's going to marry who. Uh, in Kwakiato groups in general, during the ceremony, the men will dress as warriors and sing war songs prior to the ceremony, because in Kwakiato culture, weddings are uh, metaphoric for warfare. Warfare is metaphoric for wedding, because essentially it's two groups who are fighting and negotiating over a prize. And the prize, uh, like we've talked about before, is really the hereditary rights of the firstborn child of the uh, newlywed couple. Uh, within uh, these kind of groups or within rank groups that we have uh, wealth negotiations in wedding proceedings, we either have something uh, referred to as bride wealth or dowry, right? A dowry, of course, being where the bride's family pays the groom's family for um, whether it's materials or uh, wealth, uh, as in money. Um, and a bride wealth is where the groom's family pays the um, wife's family in terms of uh, for right before the marriage. 
So to further explain kind of the metaphor of weddings being warfare for the Quackiato, right? It's similar to warfare in that two sets of affine kin or kin groups are fighting for that prize, the hereditary cultural identities of the children of the newly born child, right? And this relates back to moieties, right? And these moieties are part of kin groups, you know, where you could have the, uh, and a moiety is a very kind of fancy way for saying a clan, right? So you could have the raven clan, the bear clan, the whale clan, Man, right, and in essence, for the Quackiato, the husband captures the wife from her moiety. So this is a photograph showing you kind of the very, very be beginning of the ceremony. This photograph was taken by Franz Boaz, um, and the men dressed as warriors come riding in on their kind of ceremonial war canoes. Uh, once the actual ceremony begins, there is um, several days of dancing, as well as specific sacred ceremonies that um, act to bind the uh, new couple together, right, and the two new kin groups. The wedding ceremonies will generally conclude with a dance of uh, masks, where a lot of the um, different kin groups will get together and wear their kind of effigy animal or the animal that represents their kin group, and these large elaborate wooden masks, uh, most of which have actual moving parts, and the mouths can open and close, and they kind of do this dance that reenacts the um, kind of cultural as well as natural elements and behavioral elements that their clan animal uh, displays. And here we get to the wealth and rank part of the Kwaki Otto marriage ceremony. Uh, as part of every marriage ceremony, there is a marriage potlatch, uh, which is a kind of uh, large ceremony they, where they redistribute wealth. Um, the first, a bride wealth is paid to the husband's family group, or, or otherwise known as the Numean. And uh, to, quote, purchase the bride, right? After the first child is born, the wife's family group, or new man, pays the husband's family to repurchase the wife, right? This is known as in anthropology as uh, reciprocity, right? You, essentially, it's uh, kind of the same way of saying, you scratch my back and I will scratch your back. So wealth redistribution and reciprocity play an important role in Quackiato marriage ceremony. So in essence, during this potlatch ceremony, um, uh, the higher ranking group that is hosting the wedding will actually get all of the wedding gifts together that are provided by anyone who's attending. And those wedding gifts are redistributed amongst all the people attending the wedding, right? So a large accumulation of wealth occurs and the higher ranking group redistributes that wealth um, amongst the family groups, right? And that is apart from the bride wealth uh, that is paid uh, between the two specific kin groups uh, whose people are getting married. So if we look at some of the core cultural elements that we see during this kind of potlatch ceremony and the subsequent wedding ceremonies, there's a continual emphasis on rank. So all members of the parties are aware of who uh, has the highest rank, who has the lowest rank. All acts within the wedding ceremony and potlatch are performative, right? So when you are speaking or when you are moving or when you are uh, doing anything, uh, everyone is watching, right? You are supposed to be performing as well as simply conducting an action. So cultural practices such as marriage embody more than just the joining of two families, right? They uh, kind of can also reflect the history of struggle and of times varying between wealth and poverty. So in essence, what this is really saying is that, you know, as these marriage ceremonies happen, every single time a marriage happens, you have a redistribution of the wealth. Well, there are going to be times in history where the tribe has a lot of resources and everybody gets a little bit more in that redistribution. Then there's going to be times when people get married in scarce times and there won't be as much uh, stuff redistributed at this wedding. So it's an accurate reflection of kind of the overall group's wealth and poverty um, during a given uh, time period. So to go into a little more detail here, the wedding ceremony potlatch is a prime example of a cultural mechanism that's designed to redistribute wealth, right? There is extended reciprocal exchange where the family receives immediate benefit through resources with the expectation that they will be returned at the next potlatch. 
right? Pot latches can be called by the chief of the Kwakiatl tribe, or they can be initiated via wedding ceremonies, right? So a redistribution of wealth can happen at any time, right? If the chief deems or the kind of tribal leader deems that a redistribution is needed, that poverty has hit too high um, for certain people, or certain people are struggling too much, right? That he can call for a redistribution to kind of uh, even the odds out for everyone in the tribe, right? So in larger, more complex state level societies, you also have wealth redistribution that occurs in uh, the form of these things called progressive tax brackets. In essence, say that those who are at the top or the uh, higher earning members of the society end up paying more in terms of their wealth so that it can become redistributed. So the chart here shows you kind of the percentage that's paid by the top uh, marginal income tax uh, bracket for, so this is the basically the tax rate for high, higher end incomers. This was uh, as of 2015, I'm actually uh, sure this changed and has gone down a little bit for the United States. Um, it's been a little bit of a cut in taxes in terms for the higher brackets, uh, but, in a general pattern. So what I want you to kind of glean from this particular uh, bracket or this particular graphic here is um, not necessarily, you know, what tax rate uh, wealthy people pay. I want you to look at uh, what countries are represented here. We have places like Denmark and Sweden, which, yes, uh, are in fact smaller countries in the United States, uh, but their tax brackets aren't a whole lot higher um, than what the United States is paying in terms of the top earners. Um, and those countries offer far higher degrees of social welfare nets. So if we're around the same level, right, and we look at our own social welfare system, um, it seems that maybe the issue within the United States is not necessarily what the tax rate is for uh, specific individual groupings of, indiv of people, uh, it may be actually a distribution issue. How is our money spent once it's paid in uh, to the um, government? So progressive tax brackets really get at the question of how wealth is redis redistributed in industrial level societies, right? So progressive tax uh, rates attempt to have those with more wealth pay larger tax rates, right? So given the steady trend of increasing inequality in industrial countries, does progressive tax rates actually redistribute the wealth fairly? Or uh, do we actually need to change those progressive tax rates or do we need to take a better look at how wealth is redistributed by those who are responsible for creating the programs to redistribute said wealth amongst the uh, populace of the culture or society? So if we look at the kind of recent tax brackets or the progressive tax brackets that were put out, um, the kind of notion here that, that we have is um, you look at, um, I want to pay focus on uh, the very, very last bracket all the way at the bottom, the kind of 418,401 and over. Um, basically, they basically get a uh, 121,505, uh, plus 39.6 percent of the amount that's over 418,000, right? So really, at some point, that kind of bottoms out. Um, so if you're someone who makes large, 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 large amounts of money, um, that tax burden becomes less and less the more money that you actually um, earn. But in essence, this is what our progressive tax bracket looks like um, today, right? So you can see that uh, in essence, from based on that last graphic that we showed you, the percentage being paid um, is probably a little bit less um, than it was in 2015 in terms of the higher earning uh, brackets. So anthropology, in essence, studies uh, class structures, right? And we look at class in several societies, right? And we're concerned about how inequality manifests itself in human groups and whether or not there are common patterns in inequality, right? We look at how gender, sex, social organization, things like race, all intersect with wealth inequality, right? Do those factors play a role in wealth inequality? So class and class structures and the development of classism is kind of a primary subject for anthropologists, social theorists, and sociologists. So in terms of what we're going to talk about here, we're going to look at a few social theorists, um, starting with Karl Marx 
and Max Weber and moving on to uh, more modern theorists like Pierre Bordeaux and um, Leith Mullings. So Karl Marx um, really wrote a lot about class in his uh, um, publication called Das Kapital in 1867. Um, the, his focus was on the removal of public lands and how this caused peasants to turn to work in cities, right? Increasing essentially industrialization in the 18th or excuse me, 19th century. And out of this um, kind of moval of populations from the rural sector of society into the more industrial sector, two distinct classes emerge, right? You have the bourgeoisie, which is the capitalist class uh, who own the means of production, right? These are the owners who own the factories and the businesses. And then you have the proletariats, right? These are the workers who support the capitalist class, right? In essence, the goal, or at least according to Marx, the goal for capitalists is divorce the workers from their own work product and restrict access to economic growth, right? So surplus labor is extracted from workers and turns into capitalist profit, thus increasing wealth inequality and classism. So the question that we get when we look at Marx's kind of work or his distinction of how classes develop is really um, why is it so difficult or why is class consciousness difficult for workers today, right? I, I think about it on a very base level of, you know, you live in an industrial society and you want, you know, you want to be paid a decent amount or a living wage for what you get, you know, for what you do. And some of you may not be getting paid adequately for what you feel or you may not, you feel you're not getting paid adequately, right? So your only source of kind of power is that solidarity with one another, that ability to have class consciousness, right? Well, Marx argued that by keeping workers pay low and forcing workers to struggle daily for survival, along with uh, instituting privileged classes of proletariat workers, you know, your middle management class, uh, work in conjunction to fracture the proletariat class politically, right? So they kind of use these uh, manipulations to prevent people from banding together or having that overall recognition of class consciousness. In Max Weber's research on classism and in his writings relating to classism, he identified three dimensions of stratification, right? Um, essentially, what Weber was doing um, as a student of Marx, he was trying to take Marx's work uh, on classism and kind of modify it. So he says stratification is not solely economic, right? He suggested that class results from an interplay of three other significant factors, right? Status, class, and party, right? These are uh, have been adapted uh, today to what we call the three Ps, property, prestige, and power, right? So your kind of stratification or the level of stratification within your culture of society relates to how differences in property ownership, prestige or status, and uh, ability to garner power within your culture, right? That's what we're looking at and that's what defines um, classes. So Weber looked at um, something that he referred to as life chances as kind of the root basis for how these differences develop in an individual's lifetime, right? So life chances are an individual's opportunities to improve their own quality of life and to achieve their uh, desired life goals, right? So members of the same class share the same life chances, right? People who tend to live in higher income neighborhoods tend to go to schools that have better quality education, tend to get into better universities, tend to get placed in higher income jobs, right? So you have those kind of same life chances depending on the class in which you are born. So if we look at the work of another social theorist named uh, Pierre Bordeaux from 1970, he looked at social mobility or the ability of, of an individual to move out of their own um, class, right? And this was once considered um, in a lot of kind of modern nation state societies to be obtainable or achievable through education, right? You'd be able to break through class barriers using higher levels of education, right? So what Bordeaux found in the French school system was that class positions were being reproduced and re by reinforcing cultural norms for each class, right? This was done via what he called habitus and cultural capital, right? Habitus is the reinforcing of class-related self-perceptions. 
and cultural capital is the knowledge, habits, and tastes uh, learned from one's parents, which allow you to gain access to scarce resources. So what Bordeaux was saying was that even in the education system, teachers would be reinforcing the kind of self-perception that these students had of their own class, whether they're from a middle class or a lower class or an upper class. In 1994, the anthropologist Leith Mulling studied low-income families in Harlem, New York, as part of the Harlem Birthright Project. And she noticed uh, something interesting, that the infant mortality rates in Harlem were twice that of the state of New York in general. So it illuminated the concept of intersectionality, uh, which is an analytical framework for addressing how race, gender, and class affect individuals' life history, right? So in essence, what she was looking at was, well, these low-income individuals from Harlem, they were, they were having a larger or a higher infant mortality rate than the same kind of biological demographic group in the state as a whole, right? So uh, wealth inequality plays a huge role in terms of access to quality health care. So how is poverty constructed within our own culture in the United States, right? Of the industrialized world, the U.S. has the largest wealth inequalities, but is also the wealthiest nation in terms of its uh, GDP. Poverty rates vary greatly depending on gender and uh, quote unquote race, right? Uh, poverty is also normalized through the segregation in living conditions. We'll look at each of these kind of factors in terms of how the U.S. constructs um, poverty. When we look at um, kind of modern classism and kind of modern economic states, um, we look at kind of um, the question of how has the modern classism developed? Well, in a certain sense, you have neoliberalist trade policies um, like NAFTA. That's the one I'll use for as an example because that's the one we should all be familiar with because it's one that involves the United States. Um, some of these trade policies are what allow companies to kind of seek um, areas of the world where labor laws may be less stringent, where uh, environmental protection laws may be less stringent, places where they can kind of cut corners in those aspects in order to um, <clears throat> gain uh, higher profit margins. Uh, we have the expansion of global trade as well, right? As kind of products move around the world, um, you kind of have exportation of culture as well. And along with that culture comes cultural ideas of class and inequality. Of course, in any society, you also have uh, propaganda mechanisms that work to uh, perpetuate and develop classism using sources like the media. Um, and in the United States, uh, a few studies have shown that uh, the interesting thing is that we don't have propaganda that kind of perpetuates um, inequality in terms of stories. It's really the lack of news reporting on wealth inequality that really um, it kind of exemplifies how America normalizes uh, wealth inequality, right? So it's kind of normalizing it in a sense of, well, getting everyone to believe, well, this is just how life is. This is just how society is. It's always going to be unfair. That's how it's always been. That's how it always will be. Um, and the kind of notion, or at least the thing that uh, as an anthropologist, I would argue is that as humans, um, you know, we have the capability to implement other systems or develop different ways of living, right? It's part of what makes us so successful as a species on this planet, right? So simply saying that something cannot be changed based on the fact that it has existed the way it has thus far um, kind of really uh, cuts us short on in terms of what our actual abilities are and what our uh, kind of talents are as humans in general. Um, so we really should work to not normalize wealth inequality, right? We should work to kind of close uh, wealth inequality, whether we're looking at a larger nation state society like the United States or we're looking at a smaller um, tribal level society. You know, we should be examining how wealth inequality plays a role in determining the life histories of individuals. If we look at this graphic, which actually comes from 2013, um, so I'm sure the numbers have actually increased um, if it's followed the same general trend that it has been. Um, this shows you the ratio of wealth inequality. And as you can see, the United States is pretty high in terms of our wealth inequality from the poorest individuals to the richest individuals, right? The richest 10% to the poorest 10%. 
Uh, Mexico is also extraordinarily high. So we're only really beat out in terms of inequality by Chile and um, Mexico in terms of our wealth inequality. Um, even if you go kind of further down the list, you see, um, you know, countries like France, uh, Ireland, Poland, Hungary, um, Austria, Switzerland, you know, as we move down the list, the wealth inequality becomes less and less and less. So this is showing you, um, and this comes from the World Economic Forum, showing you uh, kind of how world wealth inequality works in terms of human populations and their control over the world's wealth, right? And as we can see at the kind of farther end on the left, we see that 68.7% of the world's population only control collectively about 3% of the world's wealth. If we go to the other extreme end, uh, about 0.7% of the uh, population, which is a little bit, uh, you know, which is um, less than a million, is uh, owns about 41% of the world's wealth, right? So you can see that um, it's really kind of interesting in terms of how a small group or a small grouping of population of humans owns a vast degree or roughly half of the wealth that's generated um, throughout the world. So wealth inequality is not just an issue that affects one specific country, one specific social organization system, right? We can see that it's kind of a global um, system now ever since kind of the expansion of global trade, right? So as globalization continues, as global trade continues to uh, make countries more in interconnected, this wealth inequality is going to continue to grow. One of the earliest studies that we have in anthropology that really earnestly looked at how poverty affects culture um, is a study done by Oscar Lewis um, looking at class structures in Mexico City in the 1950s, right? And we actually talked a little bit about uh, Oscar Lewis when we talked about um, gender and sexuality, right? Remember, he looked at kind of concept of uh, machismo and kind of that uh, uh, notion of masculinity and how it cut across um, class barriers, right? Um, so he related kind of poverty to cultural structures which perpetuate ways of thinking which promote poverty, right? He was criticized, or his study was criticized for placing emphasis on cultural practice rather than structural systems outside of the control of the individual. So what Lewis did is he went into five different economic levels um, within Mexican society, starting at the poorest and then living you know, amongst and studying uh, the wealthiest. Um, and what he was saying is that, well, it's really the kind of culture that these people build around themselves that reinforce how they behave as a member of their particular class. And the criticism is that, well, you know, people is, uh, on top of your culture, you also have these systems that are built by your government, these bureaucratic systems like, like government. Um, these cultural systems. So what we criticize Lewis in saying is that, well, you didn't place enough emphasis on how systems play a role in creating classes and perpetuating inequality. So when we look at concepts of poverty in the United States, you know, a few primary questions um, evolve, right? Is wealth inequality in the U.S. the result of systemic oppression via segregation or tax laws? Uh, is poverty perpetuated by lack of investment in poor communities? And is there a way to short circuit the cycle of poverty by working with impoverished communities to try and uplift those communities as a whole? Um, I put this uh, graph in here uh, to show you guys how, um, based on kind of the last census data, um, how extreme poverty has kind of been on the rise in the United States. Um, and more importantly, the reason I really put this in here is because, you know, there's been a lot of talk recently with the coronavirus and the effects that it's going to have on the economy that we may go into a recession. Um, if you remember, the last recession that we had was uh, starting in kind of 2008, and it lasted for a few years. So if you notice the graph um, right around that 2008 period, that's when the kind of extreme poverty rates uh, really took off. Um, so these recessions that may occur, I know that in the news they kind of talk about it as this amorphous concept, but they have real uh, distinct and drastic effects, uh, primarily on the more impoverished people um, or the more impoverished classes within our society, right? Um, usually those in the middle to wealthier classes have, uh, you know, economic mechanisms that they can use to weather out bad economic times, whereas the lower classes 
um, usually will only slide further into um, extreme poverty. If we look at a case study in um, poverty that was done by an anthropologist named Pam Davidson Buck, um, in her study she said uh, her famous line is that sweat is made to trickle up, right? So she, what she's basically saying is that um, in, in essence, kind of the classic Marxian example that the sweat of the people is made or they make their sweat in order for the profits of that sweat to go to the higher classes, right? So in her case study, she looked at uh, segregated poor communities or poor working people um, who had been segregated away from land ownership and more importantly, mineral rights um, by a lot of these uh, a lot of these mineral and uh, mining companies. So um, in the case study, she kind of asked, what do they mean by the view from under the sink? And what she was doing was looking at, well, you know, let's look at uh, these service-based people who go into these wealthy neighborhoods and work on people's homes. And it's kind of this view of you're an individual who comes into a wealthy person's home to work on their, their sink or their, their plumbing and stuff like that. And it's kind of your perspective as you realize kind of the stark class differences in terms of how you live uh, as opposed to how the person uh, whose house you're working on lives. So this graphic is showing you um, Kentucky's poverty rate, right? So essentially 1% of Latinos in Kentucky live in poverty. 3% uh, of African Americans within Kentucky live in poverty, 7% of Asian Americans, 7% of working age women, which is second in the nation in terms of uh, poverty rate, and 25% of children living in Kentucky live in poverty, right? So that's 10th in the nation. So think about that. It's 10th in the nation in terms of um, children living in, in, in poverty, and a quarter, a solid quarter of the children uh, live, in, live in the poverty rate. So you can only imagine in some of the other uh, states where it's a bit higher um, what those numbers may actually be. So we kind of ask ourselves, well, you know, most of us would like to live in a society that's as equal as possible, right? Uh, wealth inequality um, is something that most people um, at least statistically or when surveyed, would like to strive to kind of diminish. Um, so the question is, is, well, how does poverty stay hidden within our society so it's not so blatant to us that we're acting immediately to try and solve it, right? Well, there are systems that hide poverty within any culture, right? This include uh, the media not reporting on wealth inequality or uh, not reporting on it as much as other pieces of news. Uh, we have voluntary isolation of the rich, the whole notion of the gated communities, right? And we also have consumer culture that works to hide inequality and poverty as well. So if we look at a case study that looked at how media treats uh, wealth inequality and poverty, right, the role was examined uh, by Gregory Mancios, right, and he found that only one in 500 New York Times articles addressed poverty, right? So in essence, he says there is a systemic pattern of these news organizations um, labeling of poverty is not newsworthy, right? So this work suggests, uh, or this works to bury the reality of the struggle of poverty and normalize it within our um, society. Um, other studies that have looked at kind of visual media or television, um, looking at the kind of the notion of a sitcom or your kind of regular average um, kind of fictional television show, um, you know, if you really take a close examination of them, you kind of wonder why every family depicted on there seems to live in this typical middle class situation, right? They don't tend to display people on sitcoms and television shows that are living in poverty or extreme poverty, right? So they rarely show this poverty, lending to the notion that most Americans themselves are middle class, when in fact they are not, right? Most Americans are uh, considered part of the working class rather than uh, what would be considered classically as the middle class. In terms of uh, voluntary isolation, people who are generally wealthy will voluntarily isolate themselves from the rest of the economic classes. 
Um, in extreme cases, they will have higher end shopping centers um, that really only have stores or uh, businesses in there that can cater to people who can afford very high uh, prices, right? Uh, they also have gated communities as well as exclusive resorts that keep them kind of uh, sequestered and kind of isolated from the rest of the services, stores, and um, kind of uh, things that, you know, other classes in society use. So if we look at how income inequality is perpetuated in the world, um, there are kind of some basic concepts or, that anthropologists have pointed out or basic patterns. We notice that there's an, uh, a pattern of internalizing the discourse on poverty, particularly in larger, uh, more complex societies in terms of uh, nation states. Uh, if we use the United States example um, in sociology, they call it the bootstrap myth, right? That um, the only reason you are po poor is because you haven't worked hard enough or that you're lazy or that there's something wrong with you that you just haven't found the right job. Um, essentially what this does is it places the burden of responsibility for poverty on the individual and not on the system, right? So it internalizes that discourse. Instead of talking about what can we do to change society to decrease poverty, we tell, you know, change that discourse to, well, what can you do to change the poverty of your own situation? What is it about your behaviors that can be changed, right? So we normalize inequality as essentially a fact of life. Instead of trying to seek to figure out a way to develop systems in which there's less inequality, right? We tend to just think, well, that's how it is, that's how it's always been, and that's how it's always going to be, right? So we also work to create systemic structures which perpetuate poverty, right? These can be judicial systems which disproportionately um, kind of penalize people in poor neighborhoods as opposed to uh, white collar crime. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, Currently, white collar crime in the United States is at the lowest level of prosecution in our nation's history, um, or at least since they began prosecuting white level or white collar crime, as opposed to other crimes, right? Crimes of theft, um, or essentially what they call crimes of poverty. Um, those are prosecuted very heavily, right? We also have the deregulation of banks, which allows people or the banking system to lend money to people that may not necessarily be capable of paying that money back at higher interest rates than uh, would be done normally. Uh, I throw this picture in here because um, one of the um, ethnographies on the list that you had the opportunity to read, if you so chose, was Fresh Fruit, Broken Bodies by the anthropologist Seth Holmes. Um, and he talks a lot about how normalizing or how poverty is normalized in these neighborhoods that are adjacent to the um, strawberry and um, kind of agricultural fields that a lot of these um, very low paid immigrant workers work in. And he even noted that in some cases, women would jog by these, you know, women from uh, the upper class neighborhood would jog by and he always kind of wondered how is it, how are they capable of, in a moral sense, of kind of jogging by this, seeing these immigrants working and living in these little tin shacks on the side of the road, and not feeling the need to change or the need to help uh, uplift these people, so they're not they're not living in such dire conditions. If we look at consumer culture and how it perpetuates poverty, it actually works to hide poverty. Um, in essence, with unfettered access to products and services, as well as the loosened regulations surrounding money borrowing, Americans can purchase the middle class experience at massive, uh, at the cost of massive amounts of debt, right? So American children are encultured to devi desire products via mass advertising. Um, you can think about this as how many toy commercials there are out there and how many commercials there are out there ge geared towards parents. Uh, how many commercials out there are geared towards specific demographic groups, right? So cultural perception on wants versus needs tend to perpetuate consumer culture, right? The goal of any business selling a product is to make you feel like you need the product, right? Um, as well as want it. So think of how expensive romance in the process of courting a mate can be, right? In terms of going out, uh, you know, regardless of who's paying for it or whether you're both paying for it equally. It's expensive to go out on dates. It's expensive to uh, plan a marriage. It's expensive to raise a family, right? All of these things uh, kind of are related or thoroughly tied into the consumer culture. So in essence, you know, you don't really know what you want, but you know that you don't have it.
So when examining class systems, we do notice another pattern. We have class versus um, something that we call cast, right? So cast and class systems are related to the terms ascribed and achieved status, right? In societies with ascribed status, right, or status that is given upon birth that you have really no control over, there are stringent caste systems, right? An example of this would be the caste system that existed in India, right? In societies with achieved status or status that you can earn yourself over a lifetime, there are semi-flexible class systems, right? So um, whereas in the United States, as an example, uh, you're very unlikely to get into a higher class than what your parents or what you were born into, um, it is still possible to do so, right? It's still possible to get into a higher or a lower class than what you were born. In a caste system, on the other hand, no matter how you struggle or try, you will always be in the caste that you are um, born in. So if we look at India's caste system, right at the very top, you have the Brahmins, which are the priests and the academics, right? Then you have the uh, Kshatriyas, right? Those are the warriors and the kings, right? Then you have the Vishyas, right? These are the merchants and the landowners, right? Then you have the Sudras, right? Which are the commoners, the peasants and the servants. And then, of course, you have the untouchables, which are the outcasts or the ones who do not have a caste. These are the street sweepers and the latrine cleaners, right? It's almost very similar to a uh, some situation very close to, um, if any of you have read the book or seen the movies, the Divergent series, right? Um, in essence, those are the individuals who were not able to be placed in a class, right? So they are classless. Okay, so let's talk real quick about uh, something that has developed in terms of social theory that is uh, relatively popular in terms of um, our explanations on how poverty moves throughout um, the world today, right? It's something called world systems theory. It's the argument for the historic and contemporary social, political, and economic significance of an identifiable global system based on wealth and power differentials that extends beyond individual countries, right? So what this is really saying is that now, since we've uh, kind of uh, really invested in globalization um, throughout the world, we the economies have become kind of interconnected, right? So that we can kind of really consider or really kind of have a, th a thing as a global economy, right? We've all seen this in the 2008 recession. Yeah, it hit America pretty bad, but it also affected other countries as well. So there is a global economic system where multiple cultures are tied together. This was developed by a guy named Ferdinand Braudel in 1982 in his uh, three volume set called Civilization and Capitalism. So uh, Braudel's world system theory was based off of something that was earlier proposed by a gentleman named Wallerstein. Um, and Wallerstein's system positions proposed uh, these three levels, right? There's the core nations, which are the most powerful nations. So these are the ones that monopolize the most profitable activities, things like stock markets and world banks. Then you have severing periphery in, uh, nations or intermediary nations. These are industrialized nations that do not exert economic influence over core nations, but export goods to periphery nations. An example of this would be that uh, Brazil exports its products, uh, which are fruit juice, to Nigeria. And then we have periphery nations or what we call exploited nations. These are the least industrial, if at all industrialized. Uh, they provide labor, raw materials, and agricultural products to the core and semi-periphery nations, right? So if we look at this kind of another uh, common or colloquial use of words here, we can refer to the core nations of the first world, the second semi-periphery nations as the second world, and the periphery nations as the third world. So if we look at our world systems map, right, this shows you the core versus semi-periphery and periphery nations, which these have changed over time, right? During the kind of Cold War, the Soviet Union was considered a core nation, um, and it was really kind of the collapse of the Soviet Union that really kind of led to um, Braudel and Wallerstein really kind of looking at this kind of world systemic system uh, in the fashion that they did. 
So if we were to look at how our world system emerged, right, if we go all the way back to the very beginning, it starts with that transoceanic trade, right? As early as 600 BC, we have Phoenicians and Carthaginians that were sailing around Britain establishing trade routes, right? And these were Middle Eastern or, uh, excuse me, Mediterranean cultures that were establishing trade routes as far north as um, Great Britain. We also have military conquests, right? Instances like the Spanish conquest of South America in the 16th century, right? Not only did that bring a lot of Spanish cultural elements to uh, South American peoples, it also brought um, a lot of economic elements as well. And then of course, uh, moving off of that, you have colonialism and industrialization, right? An example of that would be the British invasion of America in order to establish cotton, sugar, and tobacco plantations, as well as the slave trade. So we've had this kind of historic trend of increasing complexity in terms of trade and resource acquisition that has eventually led to the countries becoming economically interconnected within this world uh, system. All right, so to wrap up, just make sure you consider how poverty or class play a role in your daily life, right? Try to consider what we talked about in terms of wealth access and resource distribution. Uh, consider how wealth inequality is seen cross-culturally, right? In your textbook, they mention a few different examples of wealth inequality, right? You also want to look at how wealth inequality um, is established in different levels or different complexities of society, right? Look at how... Um, wealth redistribution and things and inequality works in the Kwakiato versus how it works in the Yanomama, right? Or how it works in US society. And be sure to review the case studies that are in your textbook. And uh, we will pick up at the next recorded lecture with our next topic. Be sure to also watch the uh, video that is posted for um, this lecture as well.